Hi guys, thanks for coming back to another video. Um, we're just going to continue plugging along here uh, in regards to the study. Um, what you see here is, is the video that we um, played of Neville Johnson. It's the one that the Lord reminded me that I needed to go back and listen to. And um, it is providing some uh, great information for us in regards to connecting, connecting things that the Lord has been giving me in my, in my journal. Um, in this particular snippet of the video that we played several videos back, um, this information was stated. It says, what you are seeing now, this is what the Lord was saying to Neville at that time. What you are seeing now, I am about to do next. I will purify my people with fire. Like the phoenix, they will arise and go forth across the land. So I thought I'd better take a look at what's, uh, what a phoenix really looked like. I, I, I don't think I've ever even seen an image of what a phoenix looked like. Um, but it appears to be um, quite significant. It's some type of a um, crimson and gold uh, type of a bird hollowed out. Maybe even looks like it's fire. Um, I don't know, but I, I pulled this up in Google Images just simply because I thought it would be something good for us to, to look at all of these different images as to what they're saying um, a phoenix is. And so I hadn't I hadn't seen any. I, I didn't know what that was. I think this one's pretty interesting. It's just a bird um, that they're identifying here and not some type of fire uh, Although it, it it is linking in fire, so I've, I'm finding that that's pretty interesting. This this almost appears to almost look like a peacock, uh, some type of uh, bird of paradise type of bird, or uh, or or what have you. And so since I hadn't really seen any phoenixes, I I needed to go and look up and see what I could learn about. Uh, what it was uh, and, and why uh, the Lord was telling Neville um, uh, the information in regards to the Phoenix. And so I found a couple of things that I thought was pretty interesting here about legends also speak of the Phoenix, a bird of beauty from uh, the first paradise. So the Phoenix legend commemorates a bird that was raised to new life out of the ashes of fire. And some think it's only a myth, but the phoenix bird is mentioned in the book of Job. And so the Hebrew word kol, K-H-O-L, has two meanings. And many translations of Job 29.18 give a meaning of sand. But it also has a meaning of the phoenix bird. In a correct translation of this text, it indicates resurrection hope. Job 29, 18 says, Then I thought I shall die in my nest, and I shall multiply my days like the phoenix. So Job is recalling the fire phoenix legend wherein the, pho where, wherein the phoenix bird dies in fire and rises to new life from the ashes of death. So Job is comparing himself to a bird that dies in the nest only to rise again at a future time like just like the phoenix bird and the phoenix is therefore a symbol of a future resurrection to new life now guys I i'm going to tell you i read that and i said you have got to be kidding me i i really had no idea um the the symbolism that this bird is representing uh, it's representing resurrection. Uh, we know anything that advances God's purpose is possible. So God can create life when he chooses, vegetation, animals, humans, or spirits. And any new life from non-life is a divine act of creation, whether a first creation or a later recreation or resurrection. The phoenix bird can be explained as God's prophetic symbol of a future resurrection. From the beginning, God has done miracles in all ages, more than was ever written in the Bible or in any other book. Um, 
The phoenix was one of God's creations from the beginning. Animals do not have resurrection power in themselves, but they can be resurrected from death if God chooses. And just like a human, in the past, God resurrected a phoenix bird to serve as a, as a resurrection hope and inspiration for all of humanity everywhere. Very interesting. Very interesting uh, that the one who was resurrected and, ha and holds the resurrection power speaks of the phoenix bird, um, and it's also mentioned in the Bible. So I, I had no idea it was mentioned in the Bible. I thought that was pretty interesting. So I continued to do some searching and some uh, studying through, and I found something else that um, says, Behold a phoenix. And... Um, there's some information in here that I found very, very interesting. It is uh, still continuing on with the thought process that the phoenix as a symbol of resurrection. And um, so Easter Sunday approaches. I guess this is written back in April of 2007. But it goes on and talks about the phoenix as a mythical bird um, and that it's crimson and gold in color that would build a flammable nest and be consumed by the flames from which it would arise from its own ashes. For this reason, the phoenix was said to live for 500 years. Clement of Rome was the first Christian to connect the phoenix with that of Christ's resurrection. So let us consider that wonderful sign of the resurrection which takes place in the eastern lands, in Arabia and the countries round about. There is a certain bird which is called a phoenix. This is the only one of its kind and lives 500 years. And when the time of its dissolution draws near, that it must die, it builds itself a nest of frankincense, myrrh, and other spices into which, when the time is for fulfilled, it enters and dies. But as the flesh decays, a certain kind of worm is produced, which, being nourished by the juices of the dead bird, brings forth feathers. Then, when it has acquired strength, it takes up that nest in which are the bones of its parent, and bearing these it passes from the land of Arabia into Egypt, to the city called uh, Heliopolis. And in open day, flying in the sight of men, of all men, it places them on the altar of the sun, and having done this, hastens back to its former abode. The priest then inspects the registers of the dates and find that it had returned exactly as the 500th year was completed. This is all very interesting. Had no idea in regards to these birds. Do we then deem, deem it any great and wonderful thing for the maker of all things to raise up again those who have piously served him in the assurance of a good faith that even by a bird he shows us the mightiness of his power to fulfill his promise? For the scripture saith in a certain place, Thou shalt raise me up, and I shall confess unto thee. And again, I laid me down and slept. I awakened, because thou art with me. And again Job says, Thou shalt raise up this flesh of mine, which has suffered all these things. So Clement clearly uses the phoenix as a symbol of Christ's resurrection, and wrote that it hearkened to the hope for our own resurrection. Um, and it says that the Greek word for the date palm is Phoenix, and the ashes of an old date palm tree are thought to be excellent fertilizer for seedling palms. This is supposed by some authorities to be the basis of the legend. In early Byzantine work, so rich in symbolism, the date palm is often substituted for the phoenix. The beautiful and majestic cedar trees of Lebanon were also known as the symbol of Christ because of their height and long life, pointing to the eternal Messiah. If, however, all nature but faintly figures our, resurrec our resurrection, if creation affords no sign precisely like it, 
insomuch as several phenomena can hardly be said to die so much as to come to an end, nor again be deemed to be reanimated, but only, re but only reformed, then to take a most complete and unassailable symbol of our hope, for it shall be an animated being and subject alike to life and death. Now there's a sentence for you. It goes on to say, I refer to the bird, which is peculiar, peculiar to the East, famous for its singularity, marvelous from its posthumanist life, which renews its life in a voluntary death. It renews its life in a voluntary death. Now I want you to hear the next part. Its dying day is its birthday, for on it it departs and returns. Its dying day is its birthday, for on it it departs and returns. So now when I read that, I, I immediately thought of this video, because in this particular video, that exact wording was mentioned. This was the dream that the Lord gave me of the 3 a.m. Let's listen in for just a minute. So the first part of the dream was like what this image is showing. I was involved in some type of a uh, communication meeting or just conversation uh, in regards to something, something getting ready to happen. Um, I don't know who it was that I was listening to. I don't recall faces. Um, I don't recall exact conversations. But I do know that I was not actively um, uh, participating in the conversation. I was more of a listener, uh, understanding what was being told to me. And, um, and I was just trying to understand what all was going on. Now, even though I cannot recall certain specific words, I can tell you what I understood the, the meeting in this conversation to be about. It was about a person that was going to a certain area. So let me say that again. It was about a person that was going to a certain area. So then, um, so then I rolled over uh, in the middle of the night and um, kind of went back to sleep. And the next thing that came to my mind was that this person that was going to a certain area was either going to die, it was either going because this person was going to, that a death was going to occur, or that it was a birthday celebration. Now, I know that that's two opposite ends of the spectrum for most people's minds. But I think for those that are walking very, very closely with the Lord, they will understand that the death and the birthday celebration um, is pretty much the, it's almost the same thing. It's almost. Okay, guys. So um, now you see why I really, I almost fell off my chair when I was reading that other information in regards to the phoenix, um, speaking of um, its dying day and birthday is the same day. That's the exact information that I understood in this dream. And in this particular dream, the 3 a.m. was given to me. The 3 a.m. was given to me. Um, so something is up with that, that it is linking. I had no idea that the dream was meaning. Um, what it appears to be meaning at this time, but um, but it does link to a time of change. Obviously, it is linking to a time of change. So the phoenix, the birds, the crimson and gold birds um, that they're saying were alive in the first paradise, the, in paradise, um, I'm finding is, is very, very interesting in the history behind it and the fact that they were living 500 years. Um, that's very, very interesting. Um, 
not going to get into what my thoughts are uh, in regards to that as of yet. Um, I will allow the Lord to lead me if it is time to do that. Um, but I'm, I'm going to say that it has stoked the fires in my mind. I can, I can guarantee you uh, that much. So um, the Phoenix, um, very, very interesting information indeed. So now when we were talking about, um, about the seraphim and about the, the blue fire that, uh, that um, the seraphim appeared to have around them, according to Neville Johnson, uh, that brought to mind a scripture that um, I would like to, um, to share with you and discuss here in just a moment because um, it speaks of the seraphim coming down um, to Isaiah and touching his lips um, with a burning coal. And so we are coming back to the fire and somehow this is all intertwined together. Um, it's painting us a picture of, of what is forthcoming, I believe. So this is um, Bible Gateway, and it's Isaiah 6. And this is really where my mind went also uh, in regards with the seraphim. Um, this is when Isaiah is actually being called to be a prophet. Um, he's being called to be a mouthpiece for the Lord God. And this is um, one of the only... Um, familiar scriptures I was with the seraphim other than the one you know where they were um, around the throne um, I'm not very familiar with all the different types of angels but these here are um, the ones that appear uh, to be connected with the fire and so um, Isaiah was called to be a prophet and it just basically is in that year that King Uzziah died I saw the Lord sitting on a throne high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple, and above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings, two that covered his face, two that covered his feet, and two um, that he used to fly. And one, and one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. So, um, you know, Neville st stated something in his video um, a little bit further past where I had um, stopped listening um, in the video for you guys. And, of course, you guys can go back to any of his um, Seraphim or Coming videos and listen to what he has to say. But if he said in that video that he was looking down and he could see fires um, and he could see people in these fires. And um, so when, when this is saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, and the whole earth is full of his glory, then we, we know that if, if you're looking at it from, a, from the view of God looking down on the earth, then it has to be his people and his glory all over this earth. It must be light that they're seeing, uh, these fires. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. And so I said, Woe is me, for I am undone. Because I am a man of unclean lips, and I, d and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. And so basically, Isaiah is, he's understanding, you know, I'm, I, I, can't even, I can't even speak correctly because I'm so used to being and saying what I, you know, whatever the slang is, whatever the words are, you know, and I'm, I'm not careful with my words. And this is the one thing that the Lord woke me up in the middle of the night and I was up for several hours um, listening and understanding that, you know, my words have to be so, they have to be precise. They cannot, they, they have to be literal, you know. They can't even be what, you know, what somebody thinks something might say. They have to be very careful, precise, and literal. Um, you know, and he, he showed me some things that I needed to repent of, I needed to turn. And he is, he's even said it to Neville, how important the words that come out of our mouth are. Um, and so even Isaiah is saying it himself. He's saying it here himself. 
And so verse 6, Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, which he had taken with the tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth with it, and he said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is purged. So we, we, understood, um, we understood that the fire is not for cleansing. It's for purging. It's for refining and purging, and it deals with the consequences of the sin. Um, it deals with that. Verse 8, And also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am, send me. So Isaiah is raising his hand, basically saying, Take me, Lord, I'll do it. And so the Lord said, Go and tell this people, Keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull, and their ears heavy, and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and, tur and return, and be healed. So then Isaiah is asking, Lord, how long, how long are you wanting me to do this? And this is what the Lord said. Until the cities are laid waste and without inhabitant. The houses are without a man. The land is utterly desolated. The Lord has removed men far away, and the, forsa and the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land. But yet a tenth will be in it, and will return, and be for consuming, as a terebinth tree or as an oak, whose stump remains when it is cut down, so the holy seed shall be its stump. Now, when I read that, I understood about the seraphim, and I understood um, about the refinement and the purging from the fire, and I understood that um, those were going to be sent out, okay? Those were going to be part of that army that was going to scale walls and go through everywhere, okay? Um, but this last part right here, where it says in verse 13, but yet a tenth will be in it, Okay, he's speaking of a remnant. He's speaking of a remnant. And this remnant, when I read that particular verse right there, uh, my mind immediately went to Isaiah 11. Because we did, we did, a, uh, we did a study on um, the, stem, the stem of Jesse, the rod and the branch. Um, and the remnant that comes up out of the stump. Let me see if I can find that picture. This is the image. Uh, this is the image um, that I used actually on some videos when I had that study going on about the rod and the, and the branch and it coming out of the stump. That study was done probably at the beginning of, um, maybe the beginning of 2017. I'm not sure. You guys all have to go back and take a look. But um, when it comes into um, the information of, of the remnant, of the remainder, let me see if I can find that again. It brought me, it brought my mind to this, Isaiah 11. And there shall come forth a rod and a stem of Jesse. The branch shall grow out of its roots, and the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. And these are the spirits of the Lord. I, I was just fascinated when I saw that. So Isaiah 6, to me, even though it was speaking of Isaiah being called to be a prophet, the very bottom scripture, to me, um, this verse 13 really brought my mind right back to Isaiah 11. Um, I felt that was very, very interesting.
But let's go ahead and continue here with the study that I had that Isaiah is being called to be a prophet. Isaiah is being called to be a prophet. And really, he's being called to be a mouthpiece for the Lord. That's what he's being called for. He's being called to be a mouthpiece for the Lord. And so um, when I looked up to find prophet uh, mouthpiece, this is what came up. The prophet is someone who is a mouthpiece of God. And he stands between God and man to communicate to man the word of God. And when the prophet spoke as the mouthpiece, he was inspired and without error. Now, I thought that was really, really interesting because of something else that was popping up in my mind in regards to that dream about the plane and the reporter. Now, notice um, when we look at what a mouthpiece is, we understand that it's a person or organization that speaks on behalf of another person. And so we understand that be, that is the prophet, but we also understand that that could be, um, that could be um, a speaker, someone or an agent, someone else that is, or a representative, a spokesperson. Um, but when we look at what a speaker is, um, we understand that it's someone that is actually speaking the words. Um, he's speaking, he's a spokesperson for something else. And so when we look and see about a reporter, we understand that that really could be um, a mouthpiece as well. And the reason why I'm saying that is because of that particular dream that I had in regards to the plane. Um, I want to pull that up because I had a brother in Christ, Rob, send me a scripture. And, um, and it was the exact scripture that I needed to see. I knew there was some significance to the third, um, but I didn't know exactly what it was. And so I want to pull that up and take a look at that. Um, I've got Zechariah. This is Zechariah. 13, and we're going to be looking at 7 through 9. So, awake, O sword, against my shepherd, against the man who is my companion, says the Lord of hosts. Strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. Then I will turn my hand against the little ones, and it shall come to pass in all the land, says the Lord that two-thirds in it shall be cut off and die, but one-third shall be left in it, and I will bring one-third through the fire, will refine them as silver is refined, and test them as gold is tested. They will call on my name, and I will answer them, and I will say, This is my people, and each one will say, The Lord is my God. Now, thank you, Rob, for sending that to me. I was already in looking up one third. Um, <laughs> uh, I had a couple of uh, immediate scriptures come to mind about one third, but it was regarding stars and different things. But I knew there was something significant um, to the one third. And I am so appreciative of you sending this to me. Uh, verse 9 is the one that really, really stood stood out to me. Um, I will bring one-third through the fire, um, and I will refine them as silver is refined and test them as gold is tested. Um, so two-thirds shall be cut off. Now, um, I want to bring, I, I need to go back to the dream where the Lord was talking to us about this plane because um, I think I think Rob is exactly right, and interesting how even the plain dream now is tying into the fire. Um, praise God that He has given us all of these little tidbits and nuggets, little pieces that have come all through, um, and we are thinking that it has nothing to do with one another, but now we're finding out. Oh yes, it does. It's all tied in together, um, and praise God that He's been so faithful to help us through. I'm going to be pulling up this dream, and let's just take a look at a few minutes of it. So we're back to this same video, not in the physical, but the spiritual. Um, I knew that the Holy Spirit was leading me and guiding me that day, but I really, um, I really had no idea 
um, all the things that were going to be shown to me through Neville's uh, study, one that I had done many years ago um, that had forgotten all about. And I'm just so thankful and grateful to the Lord to bring this to my memory and show it to me again because it is just really answering quite a few questions. Um, let's go ahead and listen to this dream in regards to the plane um, and see what we had to say about that. So later on that night, I had a dream. And in this dream, uh, and this, I've shared this dream with, um, with someone else that had a plane dream. But I want to go ahead and um, talk to you all about this dream. Because um, it, um, it is kind of tying in to what the Lord was showing me that night. Um, I had a dream. Two times in the dream, I saw people being carted off or carted out of something. Now, when I say carted off, I don't mean like thrown over the shoulder and, you know, carted off that way. I mean like, um, you know how luggage will have two wheels that in a handle and you can tilt it forward on the two wheels and pull your luggage? Well, this was a cart like that um, that had, you know, only two wheels. And so you could, you know, tilt it forward uh, almost like a, uh, like a dolly where you move boxes and stuff, except that they were moving people with these. Okay, so two times in my dream, I saw people being carted out or off of something. I don't recall where uh, or what happened in the first part of the dream, but in the second part of the dream, I do. And it says here, what I have noted down is, in one, people were coming off of a plane. Okay? People were coming off of a plane, and of three that were traveling together, one or two of them had to be carted off. Uh, they weren't able to walk off the plane um, by themselves. Um, they were being carted off. And I think that those people, um, I think that they... Were, I think that the people that were on the plane, coming off the plane, and or the plane authorities, uh, the people that were carting them off, thought that those people were asleep. So of the three people, two were not able to walk off the plane on their own, and they were put into these carts of sorts. And um, I think people thought they were asleep, okay? Uh, drugged, drunk passed out, coma, some, something like that, but asleep, okay? And um, and I saw the cart almost tip over. They had people, two people in this particular cart, and I saw it almost tip over, um, and that these people that were sleeping were not treated with great care. Uh, they weren't. I think that the people, uh, like the plane authorities or whoever it was that was moving these people, I think they... Um, I, that's why I say, were they drugged? Were they drunk? Was, you know, something, uh, because I think that the, the disrespect that they were showing these people, not, not any great care at all, was like, you know, well, you're just drunk or you're drugged out. But I don't think, I did not see that. And I don't think that that's actually what happened to these people. I just know that they were asleep, like in a, Deep, you couldn't even you couldn't even rouse them. You couldn't even wake them up. Okay. So, um, but the one person that was in the group, right, that was able to walk off the plane, uh, was coming off the plane, and he asked aloud. He said, "Are they dead?" That was the question that he asked, and it wasn't until then that the people that were carting off. Um, the, the people that were asleep actually took a closer look at these people and started to treat them um, a little bit better with a little bit more care and respect. And so the man who asked um, this particular question was coming off the plane. Um, he was traveling with them. So they were a group of three, okay? He was traveling with them. And somehow I understood that he was a reporter, all right? Now, at this particular point, I did understand that he had to separate from the two that were asleep. He had to separate from them. 
because he had to continue to go on to get his work completed. Okay, he had to go out on his own to go and get his work completed. Uh, wherever he was headed, wherever they were traveling to, whatever they were out on that plane headed to originally, um, he now, instead of the group of three having to go, he had to go out on his own, and he was a reporter. Okay, guys, you know, how how interesting um, that that dream came out, and, um, and how interesting that it links so closely um, with um, Zechariah 13. Um, I, I, I was shocked, actually, um, to read this and to see how close it was. Um, it all is linking together, guys. It's all linking together. And um, I'm saying that to you now to offer you encouragement for those who are keeping their journals and you're notating your dreams down and you're notating uh, the thoughts that are coming to you um, and your, you know, your visions, um, your studies, any song that happens to come to you. There, there is no coincidence. It may seem like it's things going in 15 different directions. But if anything that the last several videos are showing is it, it, it is all pointing to the same thing. The Lord gives us so many little different pieces and nuggets of something. And we wonder if, you know, if we're ever going to be able to figure out what it all means. But it just takes one day of seeking the Lord and saying, Father, you know, what what do I do with all of this stuff? You're giving me all of this stuff and, it, you know, I've not been able to tie it all together. And then, you know, he just comes to you and reminds you about something and you go and look into it and then, bam, you know, all of these different things are starting to tie together. So, guys, um, this is getting ready to happen if it's not already in process. And, um, and I just wanted to bring all of these things to you. How it will unfold exactly one step after another after another, I cannot say. Um, only the Lord can, can say that. But I think it's very, very interesting, all of the different things that he has shown us in regards, and then even what our, our own bodies have been going through, guys. So trust in your father. Trust that he's going to do exactly as he says he's going to do. And trust that he's going to call you forth exactly as he has said he will call you forth. So guys, I love you all. God bless you. Um, I hope that these studies, these last several videos have provided some clarification. Um, maybe some information, maybe it stoked the fires in your heart um, to dig in deeper, to seek the Lord, um, to ask Him um, to, to, to confirm any of this. I, I just, I submit all of this for your discernment. God bless you all until I speak to you all again. Goodbye.